Okay, welcome to the third lecture of the ecosystem unit. And today we're going to talk about adaptations, adaptations that animals have and adaptations of their relationships that they create in the wild. When we look at adaptations, we see that animals have very different colors, shapes, and sizes. Very vibrant colors to recognize that they are poisonous, um, their sizes are different, their shapes are different, um, unique features in all areas, and they're able, it gives them the ability to live in all these different environments across the world. Now, looking individually at each specific um, adaptation that these animals look at, have, we also see that these adaptations allow them to have the ability to survive and reproduce and repopulate. Now some of the notes that you're going to take today are notes that we're going to be just kind of going over what are the adaptations and what are some of the things that they're used for and and just give you a couple examples just so you know and you can kind of put into your own mind some of your own examples that you come up with and then be ready for the test as we as we go through some of these as well in your notes we're going to put down the adaptations are for protection for communication survival hunting advantages now these these different things all work together and can ultimately work in the favor of the animal to help them survive and exist in the world today. When we take a look at some of the adaptations. We take a look at the lion. In the class we talked about how the lion's mane, what it's used for is really that of dominance but yet it is also a way to to stop other lions. When lions attack, they always try to go for the neck area. The strangulation hold, <coughs> excuse me, they try to go for the jugular in, in many, in many uh, terms. The mane is a deterrent. The mane is a way for the people not to, the other lions that attack, a way for them not to know where that jugular is, where that neckline is. So they can't get that strangulation hold as well. We talked about how the koala is pear-shaped, which makes it a perfect weeble that it will wobble, but it won't fall when it sits on the tree uh, for proper balance. We also talked about the porcupine, the camel, and we talked about the zebra and the zebra on how the black and white stripes create a confusion state among the animals so the lions or the big cats or any predator that tries to attack the zebra will be able to be confused on which end it's actually going after and then we talked about the plight of the emperor penguin hunting advantages we talked about the hunting advantages of the crocodile. We talked about how the crocodile is a uh, very still in the water and kind of mimics its surroundings until it's that one moment of impact that it needs to take and attack to get its prey. When we look at adaptations, we see all the differences, and we know that the differences are for a purpose, and those differences really stand out and help them survive, and that's why they're still around. One of the examples we, we went into was looking at the difference between the dire wolf and the gray wolf. The dire wolf is now extinct because it was a little bit faster, or a little bit slower, a little bit heavier, bigger than the gray wolf, uh, its, its cousin and the gray wolf was much more compact um, and, and it was a little bit better at hunting as a group so therefore as time emerged and time went through the dire wolf was not able to keep up with today's world and the gray wolf was so it was able to take over 
We also equated it to our classroom here, how the digital classroom is 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 the next step and how people are are learning at a different rate, a different way that people learned in the past. And we kind of related the same thing, how humans adapt as well. Now, we also take a look at the relationships that animals adapt into, such as the types of symbiotic relationships. Um, symbiosis, sim, is similar, same. Um, when you take a look at the symbiosis, that means they're living in the same area. They're living together. So we look at bio, B-I-O, as living. Um, so the word symbiotic or symbiosis is animals or organisms living together. And it's, that's the relationship that they have. So they live together. There are three types. You have commensalism, you have mutualism, and you have parasitism. Now we're going to take a look at commensalism first. Uh, commensalism, when you take a look at it, basically the, the thought process is, hey, good for me, doesn't bother you. We look at the barnacle and the whale. On the screen we see that the barnacles are on the whale. The barnacle really doesn't do anything to harm the whale. Um, they just are there. And the barnacles will, will be on there for quite some time. The whale doesn't get hurt, doesn't help them in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but the barnacle is getting protection. It's getting a ride. Um, so you can obviously see that the barnacle is getting the benefit. The whale doesn't really bother. It does not really matter. Then we take a look at the ants. Ants on many different types of species. Ants in the acacia tree. Um, in this scenario that we see, we see the aphids that are on the, the plant. Uh, the aphids and the ant, they work together. The aphids secrete a nectar from the plant um, that <coughs> allows the, the ant to take it and eat it. Um, and then the ant just strolls the plant, protecting it and keeping it from harm. And in this uh, scenario, we have mutualism. Ants and the acacia tree are the same way. Uh, we have other mutualistic relationships uh, as well. The honey guide and the honey badger. The honey badger really can't see that well, but the honey guide is its guide. And it'll go and find the, the beehive, and the, the honey badger will follow it, find it, knock it down and he does all the the hard work of getting into it and getting it down and uh, then the honey guide gets to get a little at the very end as well um, you have other mutualism uh, relationships in the wild as well a uh, couple others that we talked about in class the crocodile and the plover bird the crocodile after a big meal it needs its teeth cleaned um, so it will go up on the embankment open its mouth and the plover bird will fly in and and pick the teeth clean of all the excess meat therefore it's getting a meal and the the crocodile is is getting its teeth cleaned um, the rhino and the oxpecker the rhino has doesn't have the means to get rid of the flies off of its back so the oxpecker bird will actually sit on the back of the rhino and just basically take care of any of the insects or the bugs that w come around on the on the rhino so it's a very mutualistic uh, relationship and that's why it is is called mutualism and again what is mutualism it's good for you it's good for me it's good for both both sides now parasitism. <clears throat> when we look at parasitism, we know that we're talking about parasites. Um, when we see the parasite, we see that you know the parasite will get inside the host, and and as it's inside the host, it will continue to grow until a point where it, it can't grow anymore, and eventually, in some cases, it ends up killing the host, as in the case of the the fungus and the ant. Um, now there's other parasites that we've talked about as as well too. We talked about the deer and the tick, uh, how the tick is, lives off the deer, and we talked about the tapeworm and the human, uh, how the tapeworms can get inside the body and they can take from our bodies, and and continue to grow that that direction. Now as we look at some of this stuff, we we start to realize that 
really parasitism is not just death and a lot of people try to think of oh, okay well the parasite wants to kill you it's it's not that it the parasitism is it's good for the parasite but it's not necessarily going to have to kill the host now in these uh cases that you see on the screen yeah it is killing the host but it doesn't have to do that all the time um, in the case of like a tapeworm and a human you know we can rid the tapeworm where it doesn't kill the host now eventually would it harm the host and, and eventually if untreated would it would it uh, cause uh, demise yeah it would um, but looking at this and when we look at it as a whole really the parasite doesn't want to kill the host it just wants to take its nutrients from it um, and then basically in the end result it does um, so that is parasitism your three are commensalism mutualism and parasitism those are symbiotic relationships those relationships are brought about to help the animal survive help it adapt maybe it's lacking in one area or needs some help in another and so there's where these these uh, animals these organisms will come together and create this symbiotic relationship and that's it for our notes uh, for this unit and we will get ready for the test